Us. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Good evening. Good evening. Well, welcome to Tennessee. Welcome to Nashville. And yeah. It's really exciting to see all of you here and to be a, um, a part of this event once again. Although for many of you, this is a first time experience for you. And I just wonder if we could have a little show of hands of how many are first time attendees here. Yep, that's what we thought. Yeah, statistically, uh, we've been running about uh, about 50% of attendees every year being a first time experience for you. Well, some of the old timers can tell you that you're in for quite a weekend. So um, this is my 20th national conference over the course of the years. Uh, it's still the highlight of my of my life every year. Um, Sunday is probably a little bit higher of a highlight, uh, you know, at looking at it at the rearview mirror. But the most important thing is uh, what we're all about as a community. And I think the most exciting thing that, that this particular event every year does is bring us all together. And it is the entire cross section of our community from uh, the people who are living with the disease to the people who love their, their people that have the disease and are caring for them, um, our, our marvelous uh, uh, experts and medical people and researchers, people who are involved in ancillary med medical um, uh, professions that help us live better with this disease, certainly our sponsors. Um, we have uh, important donors here with us. We have some incredible chapter leaders and support group leaders and every person who is involved in this organization as a member, uh, you all have a role to play and an important one because we are like a tree and every part of the tree is important. And so I welcome you all here. So for those of you who I haven't had a chance to meet yet, my name's Robert Riggs. I am the uh, CEO of the Scleroderma Foundation National Organization, and it's really my honor to be with you all here today. So some interesting things that have come out of Tennessee um, that are some little facts that I thought I'd share with you. That the state is bordered by more, st the state of Tennessee is bordered by more states than any other state except Missouri with which it's tied. So the states are Kentucky, Virginia, North Carolina, Georgia, Alabama, Mississippi, Arkansas, and Missouri, which is probably why the parking lot is so filled with cars that have uh, scleroderma awareness stickers on them, because this is a very drivable location, and I know many of you have spent a lot of hours in your car looking at uh, the, the freeway, so welcome. The Grand Old Opry, which some of you will probably go to this weekend, is the home of the longest running live radio broadcast in the entire world. It started in 1925. Theodore Roosevelt coined the famous phrase, good to the last drop, after tasting coffee at the Maxwell House Hotel right here in Nashville. And the Maxwell House Hotel is still there and uh, serving coffee. Um, <laughs> No one can doubt that uh, Jack Daniels is something to be um, proud of from Tennessee. I enjoy it probably more often than I should. Uh, but uh, Jack Daniels died after angrily kicking a safe and hurting his toe, leading to a blood infection that would eventually cause his demise. So a word of caution, no kicking anything under the influence. And the state's nickname is the Volunteer State. And that dates back to the US Civil War. But it's interesting to note that more volunteers from the National Guard soldiers from the state of Tennessee fought in the Gulf War than from any other state. And speaking of volunteers, you will see some people uh, wearing t-shirts that say, can I help y'all, I think is what it says, noting volunteers. Well, no enterprise like this, a weekend of uh, this programming can happen without uh, some tremendous support. And I want to publicly thank, uh, and I will throughout the weekend, the Tennessee chapter uh, and their tremendous help in helping us launch this and get this conference going and the marvelous volunteers. So thank you and congratulations. In addition to the volunteers, I am backed up by the most amazing staff of hardworking people from the national office of the organization. 
Um, they can be identified by uh, the bags under their eyes and the <laughs> name tags around their necks. Uh, they're a tremendously hardworking, non-sleeping, nocturnal group of people. And when you see them, please just uh, say hi and uh, let them know that, uh, that you appreciate their hard work because they will be up uh, much longer after I go to bed uh, to uh, get ready for tomorrow. And of course, our faculty, uh, headed by our medical advisory board, our speakers, thank you all. And finally, a word about our sponsors. A nonprofit organization has to have the help to do something like this, and we're very grateful for our conference sponsors. Actillion Pharmaceuticals, which is our national gold sponsor, Gilead Sciences, our silver conference sponsor, and United Therapeutics, our corporate sponsor. And Bear Healthcare, our platinum conference sponsor and, our, and also a national gold sponsor. So I'm delighted to welcome back a great friend to the scleroderma com community, our opening keynote speaker, Cindy Coney. Cindy is well known for her upbeat, humorous, and inspiring spirit, and that's something that she believes everyone has the ability to find within ourselves, regardless of the challenges that life throws at us. Cindy was diagnosed with lupus in 1980. Since then, she has focused her life on helping others to live with the challenges of chronic illness, as she herself takes that journey with others. Cindy is an author, a speaker, the former national board chair of the Lupus Foundation of America, and a tremendous friend to our community, as I said before. So tonight, she is here as a fellow traveler to talk to us about unleashing our unsinkable spirit, because even in the face of life-altering illness, it's possible to capture or recapture joy and fulfillment and to live the best life we possibly can. Cindy, welcome. It w it's fun for me to be back with all of you from Scleroderma. I have had the great, great honor and pleasure of speaking before at some of your conferences many, 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 many years ago. And then I've been in Charleston to the Charleston chapter and I've gotten, I just have a lot of friends now with scleroderma and I have to say, you are the nicest group of people. The nicest group of people. And, and I mean that from the bottom of my heart, I mean that. And, I do have to tell you, if you've never seen me speak, you notice there are no notes because I would lose them somewhere along the way. So there, if you haven't seen me, we just go with it. But let me tell you, this is the first time I've ever spoken at night and ever, ever. And it's been an interesting day for me. I mean, I got up at five in Tampa, Florida, so I'm a little, I'm, a, I'm an hour, right now it's nine and that's my bedtime. So, so who knows what's gonna come out of my mouth? Just, we'll just go with it and see. So it's nice to be here and for those, how many of you have seen me speak before? Okay, if I can figure out how to work with this, uh, this slide is for you. Now, why is this slide for them? Because everyone, I was thinking, I want something different. I want something different to kick this off. And I have to tell you, my husband and I are in the process of moving. After 32 years in the same home, the home that my children grew up in, we closed on a new townhouse on Wednesday and I'm here so as I was going through 32 years of belonging Natalie you have probably you've seen some of the belongings that I have unearthed like the trophy that said la asked in a golf tournament and it was a horse's rear end that I had saved my husband threw his away but I had saved mine all these years so I have found some treasures. One of the things I found was about public speaking. 
So as I'm supposed to be packing, I am reading all of these things I found. I find this statement that says, an ostrich's eye is bigger than its brain, and that that's a good point to add to speeches. <laughs> now, don't ask me why in this world that would be a good point to add to speeches, but it, it was from a reputable source, and I wanted y'all to get something new from me, and sometimes, <laughs> Sometimes you leave a conference and you don't remember everything that you've learned. So I figure when you leave, you can remember that an ostrich's eye is bigger than its brain. Okay? So there you have it. That's for all of you that have seen me before. For those of you that haven't, I probably owe you a little bit of my story. This is my husband. Yes, that is my husband. <laughs> That's my husband and I. In, on April 30th, 1977, standing on the altar in the church, getting married. Good news, 38 years later, I still have this same husband. <laughs> and, yeah. I did post on Facebook that I was going through very carefully and deciding and only taking things with me that meant a lot, and my husband had made the cut. So, <laughs> um, so that was good. He is going to the new house. But on this night, on the altar, stood two highly competitive and athletic individuals. My mother, when I was growing up, I don't know what your mother told you, ladies, when you started dating, but what my mother told me is don't beat the boys in sports because you will never get a husband, <laughs> okay? So I was very athletic and we were very competitive. And that night, we stood there as the sun shone through those stained glass windows, and we agreed to love each other in sickness and in health. And I can tell you, the night we made that commitment, we were expecting in health. Mm -hmm. That was our expectation that night. Fast forward. That was our bring on the good life moment. Fast forward, 1980, my husband and I are sitting in a doctor's office. Oh good, you can give the speech. Here you go. <laughs> it's my bedtime. <laughs> um, there I sit on that crinkly white paper and we are looking, like we all do, at the doctor's diplomas on the wall. And we are incredibly anxious. It's been a year and a half of fever, fatigue, joint pain, abnormal lab results, and an unidentified illness that changed me from being someone who ran nine mile races on the weekend to someone who couldn't walk to the mailbox at the end of the driveway. And I will never forget the moment that the doctor walked in and he said, Cindy, you have lupus. Now the words for you were that you have scleroderma. And in that moment, our lives were irrevocably changed. We went from living what I refer to as our plan A lives, the night I stood on the altar and dreamed of happily ever after, to our plan B lives with a chronic illness. I went to the medical school I was 25 years old. I went to the medical school and there was no internet at that time. And I got in and I read about the disease. 
and it said that the average life expectancy of someone with lupus at that time was five years. I was 25 years old. And in that moment, my husband and I made the decision that we would live the best life possible despite the disease. And what happens in that moment, in that moment of diagnosis, we go through a transition. All change has transition involved. From letting go of life as we had known it before, our plan A lives, spending time discovering who we are now with a life-challenging illness and creating a new normal, a new plan B life once that transition is complete. And I met someone somewhere tonight and we were, she was saying that she was newly diagnosed yeah, it's someone that was newly diagnosed. And I said to her, that's one of the hardest times. I found that to be one of the most challenging times because we haven't quite learned how to live with what's going on now. It gets a little easier. The disease doesn't get to be less, but it gets a little easier to accept that this is life. This is what it is from now on. What I have done for my entire adult life, including my 30 year career as the CEO of a nonprofit, is teach people about building resiliency. I taught kids how to become resilient in the face of challenge. This it's gonna, it takes my breath away for just a minute. It will take me just a minute. Resiliency is the ability to recover or adjust from change. That's my mother. That picture was taken just a couple weeks ago. Just, that is my 87-year-old mother. That beautiful blonde woman on June 24th had a recurrence of breast cancer and went through a double mastectomy. When we talk about resilience, I added her picture. I went back in and added it because she is an absolute miracle in the way she handles things. She woke up from this surgery. She has a serious heart condition. She has all of these things. She woke up from surgery and she looks at me and she goes, Cindy, I think I missed lunch. <laughs> I said, Mom, I think you did. What would you like? So we went down to find her lunch. One thing I've learned is that when change occurs, we get to choose. There's a choice that we make on whether we will be bitter or whether we will be better. And I say that plan B, that B stands for better. And that's what I wake up and expect every single day. But being better requires unleashing your unsinkable spirit. Because there are times that can certainly get us down. And we know that. My definition, since I get to be the speaker tonight, I get to define it. My definition of resiliency <laughs> is unleashing your unsinkable spirit or learning to embrace plan B. Having better, having that plan B be better, not bitter. How many people in this room like sports? How many people like sports? I love sports. I love sports. I love college football. 
love, love, love college football. I am a Florida State. I graduated from Florida State. My husband graduated from Florida State. That's why we've been together 38 years. Um, my girls graduated from Florida State. My dog has a Florida State name. We, are, we bleed garnet and gold in the Coney household. So I love college football. Why do I love it? Because I love the spirit of the athletes. I don't think there is a coach in this nation that goes into the locker room at halftime and says to the players, we are so far behind, I think we ought to hang it up and go home. <laughs> they don't do that. We don't give up. They don't give up. I recently, because I live in Tampa and the Lightning went to the Stanley Cup, I got involved in um, hockey. And then I got involved in girls, the girls, they probably wouldn't like, women's soccer, the women's soccer. I have to tell you, did y'all know that Shannon Box has lupus? One of those players on that team has lupus. I was like, you go girl, you there, you talk about making the most of plan B. I have never seen people run up and down the field so much as those soccer players. But they have a never give up mindset. And I believe that's what it takes for us to live with chronic illness. It's easy to give in. It's easy to give in and say, I'll never be better. I'll never, this is blah, 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 blah. That's the easy way. The hard way is the fighting back and the fighting for the life that you want and the things that make you happy. New Orleans, the whole city is an example of resilience. They were wiped out by a hurricane and the citizens refused to accept that they were not going to have the city of New Orleans and they built back that city. That's resilience. When we talk about resilience, what we're talking about are personal strengths. And we inherit them or we build them ourselves. And these are the personal strengths that people who are resilient exhibit. They have communication skills, empathy, caring, forgiveness, altruism. Have you, ever, have you ever tried to feel sorry for yourself when you're helping somebody else? It's almost impossible. It is almost impossible. There is nothing like helping someone else and being present for someone else. Planning, flexibility. I live, my favorite quote in the whole wide world, the, the quote that I live by, and it serves me very well, if you have if you have seen any snippet of my life, you would understand is blessed are the flexible for they shall never be bent out of shape. <laughs> that it, Bill and Cindy, are you in here? My new friends, Bill and Cindy, there you are. You will be happy to know that when I moved over to talk to you at dinner, I left my credit card and bill on the table. And the waiter had somebody, where are you, Susan? Susan, there's Susan. He goes, where's the lady in the red dress? That tall lady in the red dress. She left without doing anything with her bill. There's always kind of a trail behind me. So <laughs> blessed are the flexible, for they shall never be bent out of shape. Works very, very well for me. And I do believe I have a million guardian angels a million guardian angels and I try not to to be kind of you know like this any faster than they can fly so I'm, I'm trying to keep, let them keep up positive identity mindfulness mindfulness is one of the traits I'm going to share with you about my mindfulness self-awareness humor I could not get by without laughing at myself it, the day that we take ourselves too seriously, we're in serious trouble. There is no such, well, it's, it's incredibly difficult to embarrass me. Now, 
it is not incredibly difficult for me to embarrass others. <laughs> My husband, who he gets a little embarrassed at some of the things that happen. Poor Tony, poor Tony. But hope, faith, optimism, creativity, and a sense of meaning in life that we believe there is something more important to live for. That's what it really takes. Because some mornings, it is really, really hard to get out of bed. So let's talk about some of these. I'm gonna talk about mindfulness for just a moment. It's my worst one. It's my weakest strength. And so I decided in January that I was going to work on it. January 1st, I wake up and I decide I'm going to start meditating. I cross my legs, I sit down, I close my eyes, take a few deep breaths, thinking I'm doing really good. I open my eyes. It's been one minute. <laughs> It's been one minute. I shared some of my adventures on, of mindfulness on Facebook, and someone posted this onto my Facebook page. And I apologize for the cuss word, but I don't know how to white out on PowerPoint. But this is exactly what she posted. Come on, inner, inner peace. I don't have all damn day. <laughs> and so, I'm working on being mindful. I'm working on being mindful. It might mean that I need to stop talking to everyone in the world and just, but so far. So my point with this is these things can be learned. They don't always come easily, but they can be learned. So if you'd ever like to join me, I did get to 20 minutes one day, one day, one day. Okay, let's talk about faith and optimism. These are two of my very favorite things to talk about. Faith is confidence and the belief that what we hope for will actually happen. It is a very strong belief. It is what you believe to be true. Do you believe do you fully, really believe that you can live a joyful life despite scleroderma? Do you believe that? Because the first step is believing that to be true. I'll show you some research, and I always love research because I love research to me is common sense, all written up in fancy language half the time. But 20 years of research on self-efficacy has documented that it is the belief in one's own power that determines personal life outcomes, no matter if you actually have that power. It is believing and not stopping until we can make those things happen. This is a pen that a very, very dear friend of mine gave me, and it says believe. And I'll tell you why she gave it to me. When I was very young and early on in the disease, they were very worried about me losing my eyesight. I had very, very bad scleritis, and they were very worried about me losing my eyesight. And the drug that they gave me was cytoxin. And some of you may or may not be familiar with it, but it put me in menopause very, very early, immediately and very, very early. Well, my plan A life included a house full of kids. I adore children. My bachelor's degree is in elementary education. I worked at summer camps every year. I just truly believed when we stood on the altar that night that we would have a bunch of kids. 
and all of a sudden that was taken away. But I never stopped believing that we would have a family, not once. Not once did I waver on that commitment and that belief that there were children that were meant to be ours. My husband and I got on the adoption list. I haven't seen these people over here. <laughs> Come over here, I haven't seen them yet. Um, we got on the list for adoption and thank heavens for some very kind doctors that went to bat for me with an adoption agency and said, yes, I think Cindy will live and be okay to have a family. We adopted a daughter. After three years of waiting, we adopted our daughter, who will be 32 the end of this month. Two years later, at the agency, they allow you to get back on the list. I couldn't see you from the other side. I gotta have a look at y'all over here. Um, and they let us get back on the list to adopt a second child, but they said it could be a very, very long time. We said, we're fine. We're fine. Whatever it is, we have one daughter. We are absolutely fine. We got a call that our first daughter's biological mother was having a second child. Same father, same mother. She had moved to Orlando from Tampa and an agency in Orlando called our agency in Tampa and said, we're gonna have a child, a sibling to a child you placed two years ago. Do you know if that family wants another child, another baby? And they said, they're on our list. So we ended up with two beautiful daughters. And ever since then, I just, believe that the best is possible. I have a bench in my backyard. <laughs> I just thought about it as concrete. I can't wait to see if we can move it. Um, <laughs> Should have left that on my husband's to-do list while I'm in Nashville <laughs> about the bench. Um, and it also says believe on it because that's what I have to believe. I have to get up every day and believe that the best is possible. It's funny, and I, I spoke in a, at a conference in Orlando for uh, lupus patients, and the person putting on the conference called me and sent me a picture. A woman, after I spoke, had believed tattooed on her arm in a purple ribbon. And I said, she could have gotten a pin. I mean, <laughs> yeah. So don't feel compelled. Yeah. <laughs> okay, let's talk about optimism. Optimism is a tendency to expect the best. We all know what that looks like because tiggers can do what? Anything. Tiggers can do anything. And Eeyore says, oh, bother. Oh, bother. You know what? Optimism can be learned because we are born kind of on one side, I call it the giggler or the grouch side of the optimism scale. It's some people be half full or half empty and we're born somewhere in between. Part of our tendency to how optimistic we are is genetic. I am doubly blessed in this area. I showed you my mother who woke up at 87 from a double mastectomy and said, I think I missed lunch. The next day, her biggest concern going into surgery, I might add, they didn't let her wear makeup. And she goes, I wore a lipstick anyway. <laughs> my dad, my dad at 87, just bought a brand new car, and better than that, he got the 10 year warranty. <laughs> so, 
I am blessed in the optimism department. <laughs> but if you aren't, there are ways to improve it. We can learn to be more optimistic by believing that the best is possible, by giving up worrying about the future and living in the present, practicing positive self-talk, and viewing setbacks as temporary. One of the wor worst words is always. If you're, if you're not terribly optimistic, just take that word away. Because things like, this always happens to me. This, I'll never get better. I'll never be able to do some of those things again. Those words are the ones that get us in trouble. I don't know if you know this, but human beings are the only animals who think about the future the way that we do. My dog does not get up in the morning and worry about the rest of the day, <laughs> or next week, or next anything. He is just fully present all the time. And he's always happy to see me. I love my dog. It doesn't matter if I walk to the end of the driveway and back. He thinks I've been gone forever and he is, he is all excited all over again to see me. But this can get us in trouble because what happens when we're able to think about the future is we start worrying about things that might happen in the future. Like, I wonder if I'll be able to see my daughter, live to see my daughters get married. I wonder if I'll, I wonder if, I wonder if, I wonder if. Anybody in here a worrier? You worry about things. Let me see those hands. Let me see them. Um... Oh, the worriers all sat in the back. No. <laughs> they were worried something was going to happen in the front. <laughs> they knew I was presenting at night and it was a risk. Um, but here's how I've heard about the fe fear. Future events appearing real. Now, my oldest daughter is a huge, huge worrier. She worries about everything. One day she was, said, oh, mom, I'm kind of worried about your lupus or something. And I said, oh, I feel kind of bad that you're worried about that. She goes, don't worry, Mom. If it wasn't that, it'd be something else. <laughs> she, had watched, she had watched something on television about exploding hot water heaters or something. I mean, she was all worried about, she worries. She's my child who, when you drive through uh, by an amusement park, most kids are like, oh, look at the rides. Mom, can we stop this child? I bet there's a loose bolt in there somewhere, Mom. <laughs> Like, seriously, sweetheart? <laughs> okay, so future events appearing real. That can get us in trouble when we start worrying about the future. That's why I'm working on mindfulness, because mindfulness is all about being present in the moment, being present right now. And I can tell you, that when I focus on being present now, life is much more enjoyable than me sitting here and worrying about what paint color my husband has chosen for the living room while I've been gone. So I'll, I'll post it on Facebook if you, Cindy Coney FLA, if you want to find out what color our living room is. Cindy Coney, Florida. But that's what happens. Another thing that helps us be more optimistic is controlling our self-talk. It's what do we say to ourselves? What do we say to ourselves every day? I, I have a very busy brain. I have a very busy brain, and I post on my blog about busy brains musings. I have a very busy brain. I have to watch the things that I say to myself in my head. Hello, everyone over here. <laughs> 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 I haven't seen y'all yet. Um, 
the voices in your head. We have to be very careful about those and take some control of those because otherwise, if not, they can get us in a lot of trouble. I know that my busy brain is very active worrying about things about 3 a.m., okay? I wake up at 3 a.m. and I don't know what is so magic about that hour, but at 3 a.m. I am wide awake and I am pondering everything that might have not gone exactly as planned that day or everything that the next day might not go exactly as planned. Remember, I'm a believer that we teach what we most need to learn. So I'm not up here telling you I'm great at all this. I'm up here telling you that I'm right there by you. I could be sitting right here on the chair next to you. But I have learned something that helps. And what I've learned are these two words. That when that little crazy hamster on the wheel gets going in my brain at 3 a.m., for me to be able to say to myself, not helpful, Cindy, not helpful. That is not helpful. Stop that. Because we do have control over it. We do have the ability to stop that. I kind of invented something else, too. You'll love this. I, um, my husband, my mouth is so dry. I think at night it's kind of... Could have been all the talking I did all day. Hang on one second. Better. <laughs> now I forgot where I was. <laughs> yeah, there was. Oh, oh, the other thing. I was going to. I know what it is. It comes back. I can't tell if that's lupus fog that everybody refers to or if it's just aging. <laughs> it's a terrible thing. There are some things you just can't tell apart. But anyway, I can, I can say it's lupus because I like that better than aging. Um, the one th my husband travels a lot and he drives a lot. And I worry about him in the car all the time, on the road all the time. And, and he drives a lot of miles. So in my head, here's my new thing. I put this little pink safety bubble in my head around his car. And I kind of send him off when I kiss him goodbye when he heads out. I think of him in his car, and I just visualize this little pink safety bubble, kiss him goodbye, and away he goes. And it kind of, you, you would be surprised we can fool our brains. Did you know that? Did you know that when you smile, your brain doesn't really know if you're happy? You can fake it till you make it. You put a smile on your face, your brain thinks you're happy. Who knew? I want to talk about support for just a minute. How many people in this room are here not because you have scleroderma, but because you care about and love someone who does? How many of you? Raise big round of applause. Big round of applause. I can't tell you how much you mean. And I'm, I can tell you from the bottom of my heart that you make an incredible difference in our lives. And we often, the other side of that, what I know, we often don't tell you. We often don't tell the people closest to us. You see the bad sometimes. You get the brunt of the bad days. I know my husband does. And so for all of us, I want to say thank you. And I want to tell you about this bracelet. Because when I was given Cytoxin, it made me very, very sick. And I was up all night throwing up, and I was, woke up the next day dehydrated. I was very, very sick. And my mother, bless her optimistic soul, came over to cheer me up. And she came in the bedroom and she opened the blinds and she handed me a box. Now, in that gift was a present and it was this bracelet. And I could barely sit up and open it. Now, in that moment, did I need a bracelet? 
Not exactly. <laughs> Not exactly. It wasn't probably what I needed most right in that moment. But it was her way of showing me how much she cared. And often people show us they care in the best way they know how. Not necessarily in the way we would receive it, but in the best way they know how. And I found, I unearthed something from Ann Landers. <laughs> Is Ann Landers still around? <laughs> I don't think there's a date on this. But I wanna, I wanna read this because often when you're a support giver, it's really hard to know what to do. And it said that too many people underestimate the value of listening. It can be more helpful than anything a person might say. Here's the poem I saw on a friend's refrigerator. When I ask you to listen to me and you start giving me advice, you have not done what I ask. When I ask you to listen to me and you begin to tell me why I shouldn't feel that way, you are trampling on my feelings. When I ask you to listen to me and you feel you have to do something to solve my problems, you have failed me, as strange as that may seem. Listen. All I ask is that you listen, not talk or do, just hear me. When you do something for me that I need to do for myself, you contribute to my fear and feelings of inadequacy. But when you accept as a simple fact that I do feel what I feel, no matter how irrational, then I can quit trying to convince you and go about the business of understanding what's behind my feelings. So please listen and just hear me. So often I know my husband wants to fix it. He wants to make it go away. And it's frustrating when that doesn't happen. And I understand that. And so when I saw that, when I ran across it, when I was supposed to be packing, I ran across, didn't I get some treasures? I have got some, I found some treasures, didn't I, in this packing? But that's what it's like from our side. Often I just want somebody to listen because I know it can't be fixed. I'll never forget the day my husband, I woke up with an incredible headache. Horrible, horrible, horrible. Could hardly open my eyes, couldn't lift up my head. I remember my husband standing at the bottom of my bed and he goes, Cindy, this is a very bad day for this. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm looking at him thinking, gosh, and I chose it special to irritate you. <laughs> um, <laughs> Okay, so for support givers, here's my biggest thing. Remind us that we, we are lovable even when we feel unlovable. And at last tonight, I want to close always with hope. I always close with hope because it is the, des the expectation of a desired outcome. That's what hope is. It's kind of realistic optimism is the way that I like to refer to it. And I told you a few minutes ago that I had a lot of problems with my eyes. And one day I met the eye doctor and at that visit, I get my eyes dilated and I bumble around and I get up to the counter to check out. And there's, you know, the counter's about this high. It's for my phone about this high. And on the back side is the lady who's gonna check me out. And I hear her say, were you good? <laughs> was I good? Hmm, nobody's ever asked me that at the end. I'm thinking maybe there's a lollipop in it. I'm like, yeah, it was good. The lady starts laughing. 
and she looks behind me, and behind me is this woman, hold, um, this man holding this little boy with these really thick glasses. She was talking to him. Well, I told you how much I like children, so I turned around and started talking to him as well. And next to the checkout is a big plastic dog with a slit in its head where they're collecting money for seeing eye dogs. So you can put money in. And this little boy's name was Stephen. And Stephen is wiggling around in his dad's arms and he's trying to get down to the dog. And I look at him and I say to him, I go, Stephen, do you have a dog? And he looks at me with these giant eyes and he goes, not yet. <laughs> and I think, that's hope. That's hope. Do we have a cure for scleroderma? Not yet, but it's coming. That's hope. That's our belief that tomorrow will be better than today that life is worth living and it's worth getting up every morning and finding the very best that life has to offer. I'm gonna tell you just a, a funny story that happened to me today. I, I got here early because I didn't want to be late. And I, you know, there are such bad thunderstorms in Tampa in the summer that I thought I can't wait later in the day. So I got here really early and I thought, what am I gonna do with a whole day? I have a whole day in Nashville. So I walk up, I'm staying by the airport and I walk up to eat lunch at this Ruby Tuesdays. And then I remember my daughter telling me about Uber, you know, that I can call an Uber car and an Uber car will come and get me and drive me somewhere. So I download the app, it doesn't work. It doesn't work at nearly as seamlessly for an almost 60-year-old as it does for a 29-year-old. Let me just tell you that right off the bat. So I'm trying to Uber, and then everybody in the restaurant starts trying to help me Uber. And someone finally tells me that there's this nice gentleman at the bar. And you talk about expecting the best. So I go with my app and my Uber app up to this computer techie guy to help him get me an Uber car to take me to what I have identified as somewhere in East Nashville, because it says there are these little collection of stores. Well, he can't get it to work either. He can't get it to work either. And this is the way my life goes. This is what happens when you believe the good in life. This man walks outside. I have never seen this man. I do not know this man's name. This, this would not surprise my family. Um, <laughs> He and I go outside. He goes, I'm gonna make a call. Frank, hi. I've got a friend here and she needs a ride. <laughs> Would you come and get her and take her to East Nashville? He, and then I get myself into this stuff and then somewhere along the way it starts, I start thinking this might not be a good idea. <laughs> know this man's name he goes it's a blue flex he'll be here in a few minutes I'll be darned if uh, up pulls the blue flex I get in <laughs> get this get this the man as he, that was helping me as he's leaving the hotel the restaurant he says he goes he drives a cab part-time Here's $20 to pay him. <laughs> Gives me $20 to pay the man that he has called to come and take me shopping. <laughs> I go, I can't take your money. <laughs> Seriously. He's gone. He leaves. He goes, enjoy it, I think. And I'm sitting there and I'm going, oh, Cindy. And, and then the blue flex pulls up. And I'm sitting there, here's what I'm thinking. I've now got this man's $20. I don't know his name. I'm getting in the car with his neighbor. But if he doesn't come, I'm gonna donate the money to Scleroderma tonight. <laughs> Cause that was such a nice gesture. So I'm gonna give him my money. But oh no, I get in the car with, I get in the blue flex. I go, now 
you're the person, I open the door and I go, you're the person that the other man called, right? <laughs> yes, ma'am. I get in the car, I tell him where I want to go. He goes, you don't really want to go there. He goes, that's a bad part of town. I go, well, so, I, <laughs> this is true. I don't make this stuff up. I go, I've got $20, where can we go? <laughs> he drove me all over town. <laughs> I rode around and had a tour of town. He finally pulls up into this area called Hillsborough Village. Has anybody ever been there? Does anybody live here? It's near Vanderbilt. It's this lovely little shopping area. He goes, I think you'll be safe here. How's this look? I go, looks great. Here's your $20. I walk around a couple hours. I get his phone number before I get out. I call him up. I go, Frank, it's Cindy. <laughs> now I need to go back to my hotel. He goes, I can't come now. Let me call my friend. <laughs> Y'all, we are all so lucky I'm here. <laughs> All I can say is, you know that commercial, don't tell mom? <laughs> don't tell my husband. <laughs> we'll just leave it at that. Okay, in closing. <laughs> oh, jeez, Louise. <laughs> I found another poem. <laughs> I love this. I love this. And then I'm really going to let you go home because <laughs> I'm getting a little punchy, I think. Okay. It's called Attitude. It says, the longer I live, the more I realize the impact of attitude on life. Attitude to me is more important than facts. It is more important than the past than education, than money, than circumstances, than failures, than success, than what other people think or do. It is more important than appearance, giftedness, or skill. It will make or break a company, a church, a home, or a person. The remarkable thing is that we have a choice every day regarding the attitude we will embrace for that day. We cannot change our past. We cannot change the fact that people will act in a certain way. We cannot change the inevitable. The only thing we can do is play on the one string we have, and that is our attitude. I am convinced that life is 10% what happens to me and 90% how I react to it. And so it is with you. We are in charge of our attitudes. I love you guys. <laughs>don't get up because thank you Cindy you're so welcome and, <laughs> well, one I'm not gonna I'm, I want you to sign a lot of waivers before you leave uh, here <laughs> yeah because I need some legal coverage before I let you out into the world um, gotta love it too uh, that last poem that she read attitude is by um, uh, Chuck Swindoll 
who, and I have his, um, I have that framed on my desk in the office, and every now and then my staff knows that I bring that into the conference room and I sit down and read it to them and to myself because it is so true. So how remarkable. I thought that was sort of esoteric, but it, that's really cool. So we are at the end of this evening, but not quite yet. We are, after all, in Nashville, the music city. And we have a very, very special thing to um, kick off our evening. And I actually put something on paper just because I want to get it right. For those of you who have been to uh, conferences in the past, you may remember a few years ago a, f a fantastic performer by the name of Angela Martinez. She had composed a special song for the Scleroderma Foundation and debuted it on our uh, stage at a conference a few years ago. And that song was called, entitled, uh, it was entitled Right There. Well, she's back tonight, actually just back from Japan where she has been touring. She has uh, been a Nashville uh, resident for a number of years. Her career has taken off. She is what the drama series on ABC is all about. You come here, you have talent, you work hard, and you succeed. And that's a story for all of us to learn regardless of what we're doing. So just back from Japan, and after touring around the world, including doing um, some wonderful work for our US troops in Europe, we're, well, we're so pleased to welcome Angela Martinez back to the stage to um, give us a brand new song, especially for tonight. Angela, welcome. I'm so happy to be here with you. I've seen so many uh, familiar faces, so that's good, these two ladies right here. <laughs> right when I came in. Um, your presentation was amazing. Um, this song, I think, really encompasses what what it was that, that you're trying to, to say to everyone. And the song that um, I co-wrote, it's called Never Give Up, so. Waking up a different day, everything's the same. Everything has changed The life I knew Is so far gone I'm on a road between weak and strong Won't let it get me down I'm gonna stand my ground Not here to say goodbye I'm gonna live my life I'm gonna win this fight Never give up, never give up, no, never give up, never give up, no, no, no. Never give up, never give up, no, never give up, never give up, no, no. Brand new time, brand new hour. Every step I take, I can feel the power. I live my life, dream by dream. I'm so thankful I have air to breathe. I feel the sun that shines. I know the choice is mine. I say love is everything. From way down deep inside, my voice won't be denied I'll sing, sing, sing Never give up, never give up, no Never give up, never give up, no, no Never give up, never give up, no Never give up, never give up, no It's gonna be okay. Never give up, never give up, no, never give up, never give up. 
never give up, no, 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 never give up, never give up, no, never give up, never give up, no, no, no. I'll never, I'll never give up. Oh no, no, no. Never give up, never give up, no. Never give up, never give up, no, no. Never give up, never give up, no. Never give up, never give up, no.